is formed, an office formed in 1978, which means a few years now, it's been going. Um, and I think the last time maybe you were here to talk about the work was in 2009, uh, so a few years ago. And I think it's um, super interesting to be connected to an office which is very much based in a particular city in, in Dublin and, and has built up over the years an extraordinary body of work there, which is, uh, none of it seems to me very small, actually. It, all, it always seems to be of, of, uh, of a certain sort of substantial size. Or to put it more precisely, even when the building itself is small, there's a sort of, it's very substantial. In other words, it's sort of, um, these, these projects, always uh, sit very uh, distinctly in their site and, and occupy the site fully, um, which doesn't mean that they're heavy, but they are uh, not quiet, um, so, but they're endlessly thoughtful. So what you get is this interesting combination of, of a substantial statement that's at the same time thoughtful um, and so therefore ultimately sensitive. So you get basically quite a lot of weight uh, in the name of sensitivity. And it's a bit of a paradox, but it seems to me it goes all the way uh, through the work. And the work now starts to drift more and more through Europe, um, in Scandinavia and France, but especially in Italy, for some reason, it seemed to almost take root in, in Europe and Italy. And in particular, of course, the sort of uh, odd thing, which is a beautiful but odd thing, of having one of your projects named as the first world building of the year which is sort of hard to get around, um, hard to even uh, introduce, but it was this, of course, beautiful um, uh, faculty building in for, the, for one of the universities in Milano, which was given the award in, of the first World Building of the Year Award in the, in the Architecture Festival in Barcelona. And it seems to me that project, again, once again, captures this quality where there is a very large, seemingly heavy object that is emphatically in the city and yet perfectly within the lines of the buildings around it. So it's not that it exceeds its mandate, but it's unbelievably solid. But of course, it's actually sort of deeply perforated on the inside, and on the inside is very, very light and uh, delicate. So you get the same sort of uh, uh, interesting paradox where there are these pools of light and even kind of white, white, uh, white quality in this sort of very, very um, strong statement. And, that, and that, that those pools of light go very deep into the ground even. So even the ground is made vulnerable uh, by this building. So I think this, this way of, of planting buildings strongly in sites, but then as it were, so thoughtfully that new potentials open up that in, are ultimately extremely delicate is quite unique to the work. So it's always very, very, uh, amazing as a trick, and of course, when I read the title in dialogue with gravity, I thought, "Oh yeah, that that sounds about what it is." So it's just a great pleasure that you're back, and we're looking forward to seeing the lecture and hearing about the work. Welcome. Good evening. Thank you for coming. Just to explain our title, the title uh, in dialogue with gravity uh, comes from a dance company, a Japanese dance company that came to Dublin and they had a wonderful uh, technique of dance where they slowed uh, the body movements down to practically zero. And it's just incredible that for us it became, a, if you like, a, a, a wonderful description of a, an architectural trust uh, in dialogue with, with gravity. We'd like to start this evening <coughs> by describing Physicists who speak of gravity as the great sculpture giving shape, order, and pattern to the universe. They speak of gravity as the glue that holds and controls the fate of galaxies through the curved landscape of space time. Matter curves this fabric of space, and matter is almost entirely empty. It is 99.999% empty space. As architects, we share these words, gravity, space, and light with physicists. And the master architect, Alexandre de la Sota, in one of his seemingly absurd maxims says about architecture, I quote, 
that it is about achieving as much nothing as possible. As architects, we understand this nothing to mean the space in between, the space between the city and the street, between the street and threshold, between inside and outside, between the ground and sky. Space is where light, air, and volume are held. It is the space where we humans stand. Materials, on the other hand, are the opposite to nothing. We are interested, as architects, in making something out of nothing. We are interested in space, volume, and place. We are interested in transparency, which is layers of nothing, illusion and effect. As architects, we anchor our projects using ordinary materials. We use brick. We use poured in place reinforced concrete, precast concrete, the humble concrete block, stone, limestone, chepo, the anchor laza, glass, which is that incredible combination of heat and sound. We construct a world of real physical experiences where materials track time and space. And I suppose the, the other reference we were using in relation to gravity was um, Fernando Tavera, the Portuguese poet. Loved, I love the way he writes or speaks about gravity, where he talks about um, when we use the word gravity, that we evoke both the notion of weight, but also of intelligent and thoughtful action. And that gravity contributes to the temporal or symbolic stability of architecture. And I, I, just a couple of lead-in images, general images, to maybe talk about that, because it's an ongoing um, discussion in our office of how buildings hit the ground, how they connect with ground. Um, this is definitely, I suppose, um, representing symbolic stability in architecture, even though it's a, it's a semi-ruin building, the um, Rock of Cashel in the middle of Ireland, uh, a monumental building built on a rock outcrop. And in, in opposition to that, I suppose, in discussion in, in, in our office about projects, about how buildings hit the ground, are buildings which try to defy gravity, like the Lina Bobardi structure in Sao Paulo, where she makes this 80 meter span in order to uh, make a public space in the undercroft, which overlooks the, uh, the landscape of Sao Paulo. Or two bridges in Toulouse, where you get that sense of presence produced by mass bearing down or mass being borne up. And you get that ancient sense of moving amidst the play of the forces of gravity. And this is something that we really feel uh, should not be lost in terms of architecture and us being practitioners in trying to stitch into uh, that kind of continuity in architecture. Or the Smithson's description of conglomerate ordering, the conglomerate, um, the buildings in Siena, the way that they rise and grow out of the ground. And Peter Smithson talking about trying to sketch buildings in Siena, that there's no horizontal line and there's no vertical line and that you can't see the edges where ground stops and building starts. And then thinking about how one makes space and how one gives, um, I suppose, uh, expression to these kinds of ideas of, of enclosure or mass, how one makes walls uh, or how one makes what Yvonne calls layers of transparency uh, and illusion. And that's a discussion that happens a lot in our office as well, is, is this interest. It sounds very simple, but simply an interest in walls. And um, I love the description that Alvaro Siza has of this wall in Santiago de Compostela, where he says, it's a monotonous and vibrant wall, wavering between nothing and magnetic presence. And there's something about that as, an, as, a, as a, a sort of a, a conscience uh, in terms of the tradition that, that we take from and that we learn from, is how much does an architect need to do? This building is, is a kind of background building it's with a long seat for the pilgrims. And, uh, and uh, how, how much does one, where does one stop as an architect in terms of making public space? How does one make a wall which has this thing wavering between nothing and magnetic presence. In terms of city, this is an image of uh, our city. It's Dublin. 
in cultural terms, we work with the culture of play. We have been working, stitching, and repairing this city of streets, squares, and laneways for many years. We work with grain and ribbon, with strategy and experience. We work with the real making and imagined. We are dedicated to urbanity with a belief in city. We are deeply interested in the life of city, and we are concerned with making place about reading the map and mapping the reading. Referring back to Tabler's de definition of gravity in architecture, where he talks about stability, we understand this to mean continuity of culture. As matter curbs the fabric, the fabric of space, cities describe the fabric of time as layers of history. So city is time made tangible. In the next image, this describes our work in, in Dublin, which over the years has been part of uh, the uh, St. Stephen's Green, a medieval uh, space in Dublin, an 18th century uh, Georgian Square, Marion Square, a Trinity College embedded into the heart of Dublin, and Temple Bar, which was a competition that we won with Group 91 uh, in, uh, in 1991, which was the changing of a, an urban area uh, in the city with additions rather than subtractions. The issue of, uh, if you like, continuing <coughs> the heritage of city, this is about starting at the, the most minor scale. These are the back lanes uh, of Dublin. And here we have a project which is five meters uh, in uh, dimension. It's the, a tiny width reconstructing these uh, <coughs> laneways that were workshops, they were the places where the servants lived to the main houses and embedding into them um, pieces of uh, habitation. So we have <coughs> built this, this house, which is five meters wide and 19 meters deep, which is about layering uh, public and private from the lane, the public world, the private world, with this screen which separates the, the two worlds. Through this uh, screen, you hold the uh, inner courtyard and control the view to, to the city. This is the first entrance uh, courtyard, which is the, if you like, the first transition space from the city into the, the private world of the house. And there is a, a laminated timber beam which runs from the front of the house right through, dividing the narrow plot uh, into, it's only five meters wide, and as I said, 19 meters deep, but it both structurally liberates, it separates the uh, spaces, but also connects. And as we move through the house, you see this the part of this beam as it holds the two spaces, the garden courtyard here, the interior of the house. So it's structure um, uh, holding two spaces uh, together and, and apart. So you, that's a view back to the entrance courtyard, the beam hovering overhead, and light between the two spaces. That project was five meters wide. This is a project not far away in another laneway in Dublin, which is 10 meters uh, in dimension. And these were a pair of houses. So the the discussion for this project was really how do you uh, not deal with the party wall? How do you make the divide between uh, two um, buildings be more than just a line? So the questions and issues in this project were how do you make a sort of yin-yang relationship between two uh, objects in a city space? And the issues were uh, privacy, overlooking, um, overshadowing. So you get uh, a plan which is uh, an entrance courtyard living, moving through down into the garden. And in section, what is interesting about the project is that you have the entrance space from the city, the entrance courtyard, and you get the carving um, of the ground. It's another issue that we will discuss in our work is really that sense of carving between groundscape and moving, which I referred to by the, um, the uh, Anita speaker, that it's actually about cutting into the, into the, into the ground here. So you get a continuity of city through carving into the garden. The other thing about this project is that it's about taking these bedrooms um, and raising them above as a type of inhabited attic and carving light down through the space, the spaces into the living. And the next um, image is, is really describing this hovering um, of the structure. These are the, uh, the sleeping rooms above and they're uh, held and allow the space of the city to flow through into the uh, into the body of the building. So you get the continuity of material. This is the brick surface uh, moving through uh, into the garden. And this is the, I suppose from our point of view, the idea of zenithal light. So you get the, the carving of the space above 
the light coming through, this is the circulation uh, bringing about. And in terms of materiality, taking the, the brick surface of uh, this part of Dublin and weaving uh, a container, this is the uh, uh, view through the, the brick, that both holds the surface and allows light to penetrate. And this small project for, for an urban institute in uh, University College Dublin was, I suppose each project is a kind of exploration or a piece of research into space making. And this was our uh, first serious exploration of the idea of, of, of way of making space as a kind of three-dimensional weave where we were using structural piers uh, and roof beams as a kind of three-dimensional tartan grid. And the reason for thinking about making a building like this is because it was or is a multidisciplinary um, institute uh, and the intention was to make spaces of overlap, to make spaces which would define privacy but not compartmentalize or separate people. And we were doing this project when we got the invitation to, um, to enter the competition for the Bocconi University and we found that this small project and this exploratory work at this scale really helped us to think about a three-dimensional spatial weave which could make a place of education. And as an opposite kind of project, um, this was a, a theoretical project really where University College Dublin asked us to make a project between an existing library building and arts block on the campus as a provocation for the discussion as to what the role of the humanities would be in the university. They spent a lot of money on the sciences and the critique was that the humanities were being neglected. So three architects were asked to, to, to make this proposal as a way of initiating a discussion as to um, what, what, this, what this, uh, this role might be. And we chose to, because there was no programme, we chose to make um, uh, a sort of outdoor space, semi-outdoor, semi-indoor space, which would be full of light and uh, air. Uh, and there would be a canopy of dancing volumes and light reflectors. And we, we thought about a number of things when we were making this project. Um, Hugh Campbell from Dublin uh, talks about a university being a place where knowledge is looked after, that it's not necessarily a place of consumption of knowledge, that it's more like a place where knowledge is tended. And so we were thinking about this as being a kind of garden where knowledge is, um, is tended. And we also thought about um, a quote by um, a traditional Irish musician, Michael Russell from County Clare, who talks about, when he's playing the tin whistle, that the way he plays, that it's not just about the notes, but it's about the space between the notes. And there's something beautiful about that in thinking about music and thinking about space between things, or I suppose thinking about interstitial space, which comes up a lot in our work or in our uh, projects. And so these um, studies of this kind of light filter, which would make this um, kind of garden into which the space of the existing buildings could flood or discharge or flow or open, um, that it would in some way represent the potential of the humanities within the role of the university as being a place of exploration and open-ended um, search and thought. Um, Derek Mahan, the poet, talks about uh, making a place where a thought might grow. And there's something also beautiful about that in terms of thinking about places of education and, and what kind of places one needs to make, even in the making of a school of architecture and how that might be represented. I mean, this was, a, this was a project which was about play, really. We were asked to provoke a discussion, and so we just made this as, as, a, as, a, as, a, as a provocation. But it was a very interesting thing to do in terms of thinking about university and thinking about kinds of spaces which, um, within which um, places of learning might happen. As an opposite, um, um, maybe, end of the scale. This is a, a lead-in lead to a house which we've just finished for the president of the university in the university in uh, Limerick, uh, beside a kind of large heroic river, the River Shannon. And the bottom right-hand image is the ruin of uh, an old mill, and the top left-hand image is a ruin of many of the tower houses and castles which sit in the Irish landscape. And because it was a house for the president of the university, we took this sense of, of the way the buildings sit in the Irish landscape, where they sit proud without um, 
a lot of manicuring of, of ground around the building. They just sit as a, as a kind of um, proud presence. And in, in the ruins of, of these houses, they sit like kind of silent ghosts of the past. And we liked that kind of stillness that those buildings um, provoke and try to, in some way, capture that in the way that we would place this house on this landscape beside a river in um, an agricultural kind of uh, landscape. And it acts as a kind of anchor in the landscape without, without, around which the, the bigger landscape and the, the gardens rotate. And because we were looking at tower houses, we were looking at vertical stratification in terms of how we would make the, the house. And so we've tried to, to carve and, and mold and sculpt the building in this way so that it would have that vertical presence and that it would have a connection with the bigger landscape, with the horizon, as well as with the immediate um, private spaces which surround the house. And so the, the form is, is, um, is uh, I suppose it's designed to be a building in the round. It's a kind of um, vessel from which uh, views of the distant landscape and the immediate vicinity of the landscape are framed, uh, a sort of building which stands in, in space. And we thought it was also interesting that for a president of a university that it would be about um, claiming intellectual territory in terms of the big horizon as well as the immediate proximity of river and trees. And again, using um, traditional elements of, of the hearth as a welcoming element when you enter into the house, the stone floors, the rendered walls, the kind of leanness of finish um, introducing new elements such as the relationship between inside and outside in the first floor uh, terrace and this thing of, of trying to always um, frame uh, and, and, and make these visual connections between the interior and the exterior of the house and, and using windows like lenses uh, within the depth of wall uh, to set up these um, relationships between the interior and the exterior world. And using vernacular or traditional materials such as lime render and limestone sills and uh, timber windows. And then how this building sits uh, in its place where all the immediate um, definitions of territory are hidden with mounding and uh, gentle slope and grading of ground. So that the whole way that the building sits on the site was considered as a kind of object which would sit proud and stake out territory. Uh, and I suppose it's, it, it raises qu um, questions about buildings which came out of an assertion of power being um, reinterpreted by us as being places of habitation. But that's something that we find really interesting that, that history and meanings and overlays and layers can mean that things, that things change, things can change or meanings can change or have other layers of meaning added to them. And by contrast, um, I suppose we often talk about the, the idea that vernacular is a, is a way of being rather than a style, that a vernacular represents um, the relationship that the inhabitant has with the landscape. And this way of occupying the Irish landscape is quite different to the Tower House because it's about farmers working the land and it's a more modest way of occupying landscape. And it's about shelter and walls and stables and earth mounding and trees and uh, basic kind of things. And in schools we've done, we've, we've used this, um, this vernacular, let's say, of making sheltered courtyards, of using existing landscaping to knit the building into the ground, of contouring ground, to make the building feel like it belongs and connects with the ground. And at the same time, from these protected places to set up a relationship between the horizon and the, and the sky. And we've used this kind of modest landscape in this small uh, competition which we've just uh, done on the outskirts of this small uh, town in the west of Ireland, a town where the mountains are as much a part of the sense of the street as are the buildings, and use this language of, of buildings backing into the wind, backing into the prevailing wind, and with, with slight moves of, of the way that one um, makes... Um, economic ways of, of somehow defining territory, that, uh, that, one, that these are the, the sort of initial lessons of, of this kind of architecture, and that one builds up from this thing of, of, of ways of making arrival spaces, ways of making shelter, ways of using and refreshing 
the, the kind of traditional thing of, of, of chimney, of wall, of shelter, of mound, of, of landscape. And the, the making of roofs, um, which uh, absorb the sun and um, collect heat and give uh, shelter. But the real reason for us talking about this project is a really modest um, architectural uh, proposition. But at, at the time of the current moment in Ireland of economic crisis, this project represents to us, for us, a moment of optimism that is perhaps what's happening in Ireland now. Because a new question was posed to us, uh, which was to build the cheapest possible temporary but imaginative building for a visionary group of doctors who are developing a new model for the combination of child health care and education both in Ireland and in sub-Saharan Africa. And they had this idea that through this project they could develop creative uh, strategic models which could have a prototypical quality, not in terms of the artifact, but in terms of the strategic thinking, that it could be something that would have a more general um, impact. And so we questioned the whole way of making buildings in Ireland, because we're in this crisis, um, economic, social, morale, uh, it's the, the country has changed, it's, one could say it's in shock, uh, and that what's coming out of this are certain moments of optimism and challenge and maybe architects having to question what their role is in the future that perhaps we have to be useful we have to try to make something out of nothing and in this project which was to be a temporary uh, project temporary building we thought about making a building which had no foundations which would sit lightly on the ground which would not use cement which would use the resources of the local town which is um, uh, timber yards and um, unemployed, highly skilled carpenters, um, that we would set up a new model for the making of buildings because at the moment in Ireland, the relationship between builders and makers and architects is severed by the legal um, structures which are set up. And that, it, this, that a building like this, because it would be designed in such a way that it, through its simplicity, that it could be built by a team. It could be built by a small number of people, but that it could also make uh, a very interesting kind of space of research and seminar and experimentation and exploration, which is what this group of people wanted. And that it would be um, devoid of corporate trimmings, but would be more like a workshop uh, which engaged with the landscape and engaged with the ground around us. And I suppose what this project represents for us, it probably, um, in, uh, incited the most heated discussions of, of many projects in our office uh, to do with this whole thing of scale. And it reminds us that we talk about scale rules and the, 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 the instrument that we use as architects. And um, to really think about scale and how the loss of scale has meant, has had huge implications for us, that it meant that we, I suppose, have lost uh, the ability to control our own lives and the projects like these um, mean that we can look to ourselves to make a future and to make buildings and make projects at a scale which works for our time and our society. So before we leave the, the previous discussion that Shelley has, uh, has described, um, one of the things that has uh, been important to us is the, uh, discovering the work of the architect Anna uh, Herringer who uh, has built this absolutely beautiful school in, um, in Bangladesh. And what's amazing about uh, the work is that when you build in uh, essentially uh, poor environments where architects uh, work with local communities, that it doesn't mean that you end up with a shed. In the work of uh, Anna Herringer, the, the wonderful thing of that school in Bangladesh is that she has taken the local equivalent of mud, has taken the, uh, the bamboo, and has made a school which is uh, a modern interpretation, uh, a, a collaborative work between kind of east and west, and not ending up with a shed, but ending up with an absolutely poetic piece of, of architecture. So the you're, issue you're speaking about the small scale big change exhibition in MoMA. Yes, it yeah. was in MoMA, but yeah. we had seen the work before it was an exhibition there, but that mm. exhibition was a wonderful exhibition because it, that whole issue of scale and meaning mm. and uh, interpretation and work within uh, various countries. But what we, when we move on now in, in uh, uh, 
the placing our uh, number of our buildings uh, in, in city states. This is an aerial view of a part of Dublin where you see uh, St. Stephen's Green and Merriam Square, which is an amazing, uh, if you like, a, an urban room. It's made up of a collection of a series of houses, each of which are about eight meters wide, but the collection of each of those houses makes this public space. And what interests us, I suppose, is the, the simplicity and the complexity of the wall. In our studies of the, um, Sorry, sir, I think this one, this one here. In our studies of the, of the city, of the Georgian Wall, what is fantastic is that when you actually analyze this wall, it's between 50 and 70% solid in terms of uh, surface. But in that uh, 50 or 70%, the amount of light that enters the interior to the, to the rooms is absolutely um, uh, beautiful. And the issue for us, I suppose, is about grain and rhythm of walls about repetition and not sameness, about richness and not complexity. For us, when we look at these, wi these windows and this wall, and then we look at the chimneys, and each of the chimneys have a chimney pot, and on the top of that pot is really how the air enters into each individual room in that, com in that complex. And for us, what's amazing is that each of these pieces represent a straw-like connection down into those spaces both to take air in and to draw smoke out, but it's representing the individual space within. In Dublin, the public buildings um, are generally uh, represented by stone. And for us, I suppose it's an issue of gravitas, in terms of this evening conversation about uh, gravity. That gravitas, also another interpretation of the word, is about meaning and embedded meaning uh, in cities. So stone, by its nature has weight and mass and it, it has a certain uh, connotation of, of um, continuity. When we built this building for the Department of Finance in the structure of, of Dublin, the issue I suppose is raised for us is that what I love about this building is that when you're walking past it, you hardly notice it, but when you enter in to the building, your sense of the city um, is heightened. And as you move through the, the, uh, the building, what happens is that the circulation is on the edge. So as you move ab about, the city is, uh, is framed. And the public representation of the building is very interesting, actually. It's, a depart it's part of the Department of Finance. Uh, it's embedded in the city. And uh, it's probably the first building that we have made that's been attacked. There was a student demonstration uh, in terms of uh, raising of fees, I think, for education. And what they did was they attacked the building with eggs. And you think that that's a very minor um, <coughs> operation, but it's in fact a form of chemical warfare. Because the relationships between egg and limestone is actually a chemical reaction. So at the moment, when you visit Dublin, if you look at this building, you can see the impact of egg on limestone, and it will take some time for that, uh, if you like, attack to be um, uh, dealt with. But it's just interesting that the building represents the Department of Finance and had this reaction. For us, it's just a very interesting thing that buildings have a role and that they can be uh, a symbol of, of power. But in terms of the interior of the building, what we've done is that we make, there's no major space in the building and we have used the staircase as the main a circulation uh, volume within the building. And the rhythm, the circulation of the building is at the edge. What's unique for us about this building is that you circulate on the perimeter. It's a type of cloister, and your relationship to the city is reinforced at every level. And the uh, staircase is placed to the front to the city. And you have this rhythm, this footfall, as you walk around these raised uh, cloisters uh, on the circulation, you have solid and void, solid and void. So your relationship to, to the city is one of either balcony or a projected window. And for us, in terms of this evening's conversation about gravity, this is a three meter, a nine foot cantilever of the staircase relative to the street. And for us, what's interesting is that the tonnage of stone raised above the city is felt at this, uh, at this moment. So the relationship between the raised staircase and the city is, if you like, emphasized uh, by the uh, by the hanging stone, 
And it's something that we talk about in our office as architecture being the new geography, that we actually, the more and more we build, that now that uh, the city has become the place where we live, it is a form of geography. And these stone uh, conglomerates, which um, are just about, is described here about overhang, is something about the weight and nature um, of the material of lime. And when the limestone, this is the um, it's, uh, four inches, 100 millimeter uh, depth of stone, which is actually stone planks and not, uh, uh, it's not a thin uh, veneer on the building, it's actual stone planks, which gives a sense of weight and uh, continuity. The depth of the stone wall, we call this a, a vertical weave of stone and glass, where you can stand in the depth of the wall, where the experience of the depth is something that is, that is real. Um, another city, this is uh, on the left hand side is the map of Dublin with the Liffey in the centre, and on the right hand side is a map of Milan to the same scale. And in, um, uh, we were one of 10 uh, architectural firms for a competition for an extension to the university, Bocconi University, in the, in the heart of, of Milan. The centre of Milan is here with the Duomo, half an hour uh, walking south are these Spanish walls which enclose the city. And in the Google map here, you see the, the project just outside these Spanish walls. This is the, uh, the, 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 the project uh, for Bocconi. And we had known um, uh, Italy, obviously, and we'd known it for its, its design and its film, but we didn't know Milan uh, other than being tourists. And what's amazing about the city of Milan is the, is the Duomo, not only for itself as a, a beautiful cathedral, but also for this amazing space on the roof of the Duomo, which is really a stone mountain in the middle of the, of the city. And it's a wonderful place to visit because between the structure and the uh, moving people, you get this fantastic dialogue. And this is a, a model made by uh, some students of ours in, in Grisio in Switzerland, which kind of captures that sense of this stone uh, mountain uh, held by the structure within the, the, the body of, of a city. Also the fantastic atmosphere of the Galleria in, in, in Milan. So as architects, the issue of uh, gravity of surface, the, the actual surfaces of a city like this, um, which is um, uh, in Italy, the range of stones that can uh, cover the, the floor of the city uh, astounded us. And the walls are covered in many, many stones. This one was one that we really respected. It's called Cepo. And the amazing thing about Cepo is that it's like geological concrete. It has these uh, pieces that are held within the, the fabric of the stone. And the way that it's built in Milan is that it uh, has these tiny uh, junctions, uh, uh, the, which are, they have the capacity to make the stone uh, monolithic because of this, the actual joints are so small. And also the character of Milan. It's a very tough city on the outside, but has this beautiful layering. So what for us, was a, a, at one level exclusion, allows you to enter into the private world of, of uh, people's uh, lives. And the site, the university, the character of this university is that it has a number of buildings within the structure of the city. So the Spanish walls, the university campus, which is made up of individual buildings embedded in this part of the, the city, uh, made by um, architects such as uh, Pagano and Muzio, and we were asked to build a building uh, roughly in this uh, section here, between a busy road um, on running uh, in this direction and a quiet road from this side and connecting into the campus. And the fantastic thing about the project was that it was an enormous project for a start. It has, a, the, the requirement was uh, for a thousand uh, offices for um, professors, for an aula menu for a thousand people and a number of seminar rooms, five seminar rooms for uh, 300 people. So it was an enormous um, organizational um, request on a site uh, in Milan that already had planning permission for a building that they wanted something else from and there were uh, height restrictions. So the brief was to build um, offices, to build all the conference buildings below ground. And our question was um, to build below ground, um, to bury the conference and those spaces um, had to be questioned, that you needed uh, light to be brought deeper and deeper into the ground. And you need the, also the question was, when you had a, a university, was it not an opportunity to connect city, to connect city into campus rather than a building becoming a wall? So this diagram is really the interpretation of the brief, where we took 
the bars of offices of the um, professors and we made them into a type of uh, raised attic space that both held the uh, offices above but allowed the light to penetrate, penetrate through the roof and to corrupt the ground and erupt the ground so that spaces uh, could reach the light and that light would be brought down deep uh, into, the, into the earth. And these study models, which is looking uh, for the brain, uh, these are interpretations of the scale of the building. We were trying to come to terms with the, uh, between 45 and 65,000 square meters of area to be embedded in the heart of Milan. And one of the issues of Milan was also how the surface, uh, how the surfaces of beautiful stone could form a continuity. And for us, we, this is a drawing bringing the surface of the city right through the new building and joining the campus. Strategically, what we did was we took the major room, the Aula Magna, and placed it on the cusp between the city, the major route, and the side street. So we moved the Aula Magna to become that interface between university and city. And we, had the ent we delayed the main entrance down the quieter street to the heart of the plan, which was here. So you enter the plan at this point, you have a number of choices. You can continue into the campus through here. You can arrive to this point, the entry to the uh, Aula Manu, and you drop down five meters. You go 15 feet down to the foyer below. And that space is the inter uh, it's like the interstitial space before you enter the Aula. And the third ingredient was the the hall for the professors. So the thousand professors has their own uh, entrance hall, which is in this uh, position. So structurally, we divided the, uh, the building into a number of uh, segments. We made a judgment in distance to say that 25 uh, meters, 75 feet, was uh, an appropriate dimension to make uh, uh, corridors for offices. And we used these offices like an abacus uh, held uh, in, in this structure. So the plan essentially was um, a series of voids, uh, these X's representing uh, courtyards that carved down through in the study model. And this uh, sketch is really about how we would modify the sockets of above and below ground between one another to make the spaces of the university. And for us, this evening's discussion is in dialogue with gravity, the issue of how you would actually suspend and make this structure. How would you make this world if you wanted to suspend uh, one above the other. And this uh, in a, is an important drawing for us because it's the structural point uh, drawing where we place the, the main structure at the upper level. So the structural beams are at the highest point and hanging from them are these offices and that allowed us to have free forming uh, surfaces of the soffits to separate the ground hugging spaces and the upper world. So these are the, this is the uh, structural sketch to achieve, to achieve that. The model, uh, sorry, the, the uh, drawings of the competition, the, um, every 25 meters we have these structural uh, diaphragm walls, we have these offices either single corridor or double corridor, and we have the long section which is the Aula Magna cocooned at the end, and we have these series of courtyard raised garden spaces bringing light uh, deep into the, into the section. The section here shows the structure at the upper level, the ground and the carving below, and this uh, perspective section at competition uh, phase shows the entrance of the city going through the students coming down the student ramp, coming down five meters and nine meters to the lower level, or the foyer at five meters below. So you get this vertical uh, connection of light and space and horizontal connection of city through into campus. And in terms of language, this was an important drawing a making of a, of a collage uh, which is about language. How do we make a building that inserts itself, embeds itself into contemporary Milan? And the, the bars of offices are left to be um, expressed. The library, the ex-library position acting as a crust and the uh, Aula Magna coming up with its periscope type uh, light uh, loop scoops to bring air and light down into the space. And we got, if you like, courage from the project which is not far from uh, the, the, the site uh, on Croce Italia uh, by um, uh, Moretti, which is this fantastic expressive uh, uh, project in terms of its, its language. And embedding this project into this kind of nondescript part of Milan, it's not a, a pretty part of the city, but an interesting one in terms of a foggy morning, placing the drawing for the competition of this uh, Aula Manu playing its role on the relationship with the city 
seeing itself at night as being a lantern connecting with the uh, foggy and everyday part of Milan and the office structures themselves forming these uh, beam spaces expressed on the city face. And the study model for the competition, the bar of accommodation, the aula as a kind of a knuckle to the end, the carved spaces into the earth, the bars of offices building up to the structure above. In terms of the aula mania then, that the, the two parts of the aula, one part cantilevered 22 meters beyond its uh, uh, counterpoint uh, here, carving into the city and allowing light uh, down into the spaces. This was a model that was on exhibition in the Biennale in, in, in Venice. And the great thing about the building was that it took a year for this um, groundworks to be completed. This is a carving into the earth, 22 meters below, 11 meters below the water table. So the building becoming embedded, these are the great feet of, feet of the, these diaphragm walls which are marching across the site every 25 meters. Each of them, this one holding the Alemania, these ones holding the office bars, different elevation to each of these diaphragm structural walls, built uh, first as they marched along the site in 2006. Then the beams are placed at the upper level, each of these beams above. Here are these beams in position with the uh, steel rods hanging down, waiting to receive the plates of the offices and hung gardens below. Here the, the uh, hanging gardens arrive and the structure hanging them and clipping them into position. And above is the section which is to do with lightness and hanging. And this is a section through the Alemania which is about weight. And you see this 22 metre uh, cantilever gone beyond the line of the glass and a person on the street level. So you have the street, below street, continuity of the street through and the offices above. The long section then with the aula showing this, the, the, like the crystal interior of the project where each <coughs> office, each office need, uh, felt every professor needed natural daylight, needed a view out. So these crystal uh, hanging uh, sheared glass uh, protections um, act as layering devices for light and for privacy within uh, each of the offices. <coughs> so the building is essentially about a crust in the city and about an interior world which is a uh, crystal uh, lapping, looking up at these hanging crystal uh, light uh, glass shards that form the <coughs> edge and also in terms of Chepo. I mean the amazing thing about Chepo is that it is ordinary and the clients when we chose Chepo, they were surprised because Chepo in Milan is actually quite an ordinary um, um, material, but we felt that we wanted to use an ordinary <coughs> material in an extraordinary way. And the clients um, did a very nice thing and went and bought the, uh, the quarry so that the, uh, <laughs> so that the project would have enough stone. And it's interesting, we, we're not showing it tonight, but there are fantastic images of actually visiting that quarry. And the amazing thing was that the way they quarry in Italy is they carve into the earth, they carve these huge spaces, these nine meter by nine meter by nine meter cubes of voids to take out the stone. And it was uncanny. When we arrived to the quarry in, in north of Milan, the actual shape of the face of the quarry was very like the slope of the Aulamania. It was like as if there was a one-to-one -one stone model in the mountains uh, north, of, north of Milan. Just embedding this building, this is arriving from the south. If you come from Viale Blini, the building is very quiet up in the um, up in the distance. There, it has a certain kind of quality of merging, uh, like a veil. In, in the Elizabeth Capps, the uh, professor from Stockholm, writes very beautifully about this sense of the building being like a veil and unfolding itself uh, in the city. But then, when you come to the corner, it stands its ground and makes this, if you like, a lantern to connect to to Milan. Here's one of our architects, Anna. Ryan uh, playing her cello illegally on the roof of the, um, of the Aula Mania in the space, it's a terrace for the professors uh, at the roof of, of the uh, Aula Mania. And this is the great cavern between the, the entrance, the, what were originally um, 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 our meeting rooms now, this, this uh, if you like, shield on the, on the side street, which is shielded from the, the very tough uh, Milanese sun by these uh, tiny shards of, of openings along that facade. And then this um, screen, this clear glass screen, which separates the city from this space and leads you in. And the various moods of this space um, uh, uh, underneath the Alemania. And as you move, this issue that we talked of, of in, in space that we share with physicists, the issue of gravity and space and light. This is um, Shelley standing in a, in a kind of a beam of light in this space with the city, with the city above. 
moving into the building underneath the, the bringing the chapel floor uh, of the city through and bringing the students down the nine meter uh, ramp, bringing uh, the uh, professors up these uh, uh, staircases, the structural handrail in this nave space with a uh, light, zenithal light, and these staircases acting as kind of dancing uh, pieces within this, this wall. As the public move through and as you carve down below, these spaces sometimes are used in an ordinary way of stepping below, and sometimes they're colonized by, um, by uses that we didn't anticipate. This is a, a gathering on the stepped uh, ramp, people having a, sharing a, a kind of festive uh, in the building. And for us, the issue of structure and the kind of tussle of giants, this is a, a 75 foot beam uh, floor, that's uh, zero, that's ground level, so you get minus five and minus nine. So you bring the city tumbling down and you make these layers of, um, of occupation within the building. And for us, we talked earlier on about layers of transparency and layers of, uh, of connection. This is looking through the space. What's really interesting for us in the project is that, yes, there's a rigor in terms of the uh, every 25 meters you have this structure, but space and light actually dance between them. For us, this experiment, um, this connection diagonally in terms of light is something that will, has profoundly influenced us in terms of how, how light actually brings your eye in a diagonal movement. And for us, this is the kind of uh, an important space for us. The city above, the uh, uh, weight of the, the aula over, uh, overhead, and the uh, gathering of people below. And we use this material, this, um, if you like, Bianca Laza. The deeper we went down, we left the chapel at zero and brought it down uh, to this point of, uh, this is Bianca Laza. And sometimes it's described like an oyster shell, that as you move down through the building, the light is brought down, reflected by this Bianca Laza, and you see the, the, the hanging garden and the light coming down in terms of case story. The Bianca Laza leading into, this is the, the surface of the floor on minus <coughs> five, and the reflections, which for us have turned out very beautifully, and this carved interior space of the aula, where the three roof lights scoop daylight deep into this, uh, the only space in the building that has an interior lining is the aula. So we lined this for acoustic uh, uh, reasons <coughs> in terms of the, uh, of the space, the aula with its natural light, and daylight coming into the space. And just uh, the, the final few images of this project is this is a rainy night in terms of uh, Milan. Uh, these are economists uh, having a party uh, why they should, we don't know, but uh, there's, uh, they have organized these um, uh, dancers. And for us, what's amazing is when, when we go to Milan, it's the, the, the primitive relationship between the weight of the, uh, of the aula, 22 meters cantilevering overhead, that it's the one space that when we go to Milan that we want to go back to. And it's interesting that, that people felt the need to dance in the space. It's just there's some relationship between city uh, being held between the, the power and weight of the aula above and the city being framed together that makes this kind of a primitive space. I, if you go to Milan uh, mm -hmm. and if you have a chance, it would be interesting if you yourself feel that, that sensation when, you're, uh, when you uh, stand in that space, which we do. In uh, 2009, uh, we won a competition to make another School of Economics in Toulouse. So the brief was almost exactly the same as the Milan project, except it's about one-sixth of the, the size. And I suppose as a city, I mean, we're, we're presenting really in one after the other, Dublin, Milan, Toulouse. And as a city, Toulouse couldn't be more different from, from Milan because I suppose of its, its history, its location, its climate, uh, it has Celtic and Roman origins. It has um, a big river, the Garonne, which comes, uh, which comes through it. And um, it, it's so much more, I suppose, maybe, I don't, I, I don't know how to use the, it's not, maybe it is beautiful. It's, it's an absolutely beautiful city that you completely fall in love with, um, where Milan is a more um, formidable city that we grew to love and miss actually because over six years you do develop an emotional relationship with the city but Milan is austere and hard and very often grey and Toulouse is rich and uh, and red and full of colour 
and has a completely different kind of atmosphere. So again, it's the challenge of an architect coming to yet another place and how do you make a project appropriate to that place? And um, we were speaking earlier about, somebody asked us, how do you teach students about place? And I don't know the answer to that, but all we can do is teach ourselves how to look at a place, how to read a place, how to see it. And we very often look at places from the small to the big. And we look at very particular elements like the way buildings meet the ground, the fact that you have buttresses, you have these beautiful towers, these very surreal facades, you have courtyards, courtyards which frame the sky in a kind of extraordinary way. And the most amazing, memorably, mem most amazingly memorable interior rooms like this um, space of the Jacobin uh, in Toulouse, which is probably one of the most unique spaces we've ever visited, but we can't analyze why. We don't know why. It has these columns marching down the middle, but they're not quite in the middle. And then when the light changes, this heroic structure somehow dematerializes. So we're in this context, this rich, um, picturesque context, uh, and also in the, historically we're in the context of the, um, the medieval wall, which is the old wall of the city. We're at a point where the old city meets the new city. So we're in a breach in the wall, in this five meter high uh, brick wall. And we're also in a, in a place which has um, the canal, the media canal meets the Garonne at this point. So it's a, it's a confluence of different conditions and different geometries. The canal meets the big river and we have these strategic kind of, these kind of strata, these stratified layers of water, towpath, road, medieval wall, and the walls of, of the city. And it has these wonderful um, series of, of, of elements. And while Milan, in a way, um, is the, the Bocconi project is, um, it reflects the, perhaps the defensive, impenetrable quality that, uh, that that city has. Here we felt quite different standing on this space where one really feels the kind of draw of the city to reach out to the city. It didn't feel like a place that one should uh, be disconnected from. The strategy was to stack the public rooms of the, um, the School of Economics. Again, it's the same program as, as Bocconi where you have um, offices for research professors and you have public rooms which are shared. So we stacked the public rooms to the river and we made spaces between those bub uh, public rooms which would frame the views of the city and the views of the, of, of the river. So it's very different, it's not about burying, it's more about um, making a wall, making a wall to the city through which the, um, the inhabitants uh, and the professors could reach out and always be in contact with the city. So this um, confluence of geometries, its relationship with the canal, with the river, with a very important uh, public square, with the, um, the Saint Pierre Bridge, with these elements of um, uh, esplanade, uh, uh, kind of boulevard, the medieval wall which marches down this, this, uh, on this axis, and here we are in the breach in this wall. So I suppose in a sense this project is it's about um, making buttresses. We made six buttresses, which I can show you in the, in, in the plans. Um, and we, we thought about it as carving a solid and making layers of spaces where you make a threshold space between city and the interior heart of the building, where you would make external circulation as well as circulation within the interior. And because of the climate, because it's really hot and um, still in the summertime, it's also very win windy in wintertime, but we worked very hard at looking at the way that we would manipulate walls and the way that we would make walls work in terms of light and shade. And so we thought about this as being the heart of the project. It has quite a, um, uh, an eccentric kind of plan at lower levels where it grows out of the ground with these big elements of the public rooms uh, relating to the, the canal and the river and the more ordinary offices stacking behind, making a kind of background um, element to this more foreground uh, part of the project. And uh, allowing light to enter deep into the building, but using elements like cloisters and colonnades to hold the 
the surface and to hold the edge of the, of the project. And it's also, I suppose, about um, control of, of climate and um, control of temperature, about the, um, the uh, orchestration of light and uh, shade. And it's something that we, um, in a lecture recently, David Leatherbarrow gave in Dublin, um, he, he made a beautiful statement, which was something like um, the way that architects, architects modulate light and temperature at the edges of buildings has a social significance. And we found that a really interesting comment because here we're making only outdoor space as public space because all the spaces we found in Toulouse that we loved or that we could relate to were practically outside, um, cloisters, courtyards, staircases, um, rooms which have uh, openings but no glass and that somehow Toulouse is very much about the layering of space and that's to do with the climate as well as to do with the, uh, with the culture. And looking at the, the form of the project in context where it appears quite rational at roof level but it grows out of the ground in a kind of eccentric sort of way. And this is the forecourt to the, the gateway to the university from the busy square which is uh, used by the students and making this threshold, which is the gateway, but that somehow you would connect through this um, uh, space, which is formed by the sky cloister, but is still open to the sky, and you see deep into the heart of the university. And what I mean about the, the, the project being um, eccentric at the lower levels is it's adjusting to the particular qualities of the site, and it's a looser arrangement of public rooms to the to the to the, um, the river and the canal and more repetitive elements to the back, uh, but where it is and does feel like a kind of a background kind of project. So we build up the, the layers and the levels and we're always moving externally. The, the only space that's conditioned, fully air conditioned and inside are the office suites. Everything else, when you move from an office to a lecture theater, you move outside. You're protected from the wind and the rain, but you're not inside. And this was done for, for ideas of, well, basically to do with climate, but also the opportunity of making a space which is protected but still feels like part of the city, that somehow the city is like a breeze that moves through the, the space of the university. And we circulate externally as well as in terms of the way that one moves. There are these external staircases which are like uh, buttresses, six of them, and they deal with all the issues of fire escape. And what that means is that the, the way that one moves in the central space can be free because all those practical elements are dealt with. It also meant that we could offer surface to the sun and we could offer surface to the city and windows, the repetitive windows of the offices were in more protective, protected <coughs> um, locations. And the space that we've made is um, again, it's to do with this thing of the gravitational pull between the interior world of the university and the world of the city outside, that somehow you would always feel visually connected with the city at large. And, and the way of moving through this space, this is the central space between the offices um, behind and, and the foreground building, the lecture theatres to the front with their, they have these cocktail areas and terraces between them so that you can move um, freely through the um, through the landscape of the building. And because we're making this, this climate which is outside, inside, inside, outside, and we're trying to map the, the lines between what has to be fully controlled, what's partially controlled, what's outside, we're mapping this scientifically in terms of wind, uh, and because wind is an issue, and we're modulating facades to do with um, the controlling of wind speeds, and we're also modulating, modulating facades to do with the control of light and heat gain. So that this combination of a scientific mapping of the performance of a project parallel with the design of the architectural facades and um, elements. And then, sorry, the inter kind of twining of internal spaces and external spaces, again, these kind of trapped courtyard spaces which um, make a kind of intern interior landscape within the, the building. And the, the language of the building, this is a tourist uh, poster which we bought when we went to see the, the site and we used it as a way of testing how the building would work 
within the kind of uh, skyscape or landscape of the of the city, and you see these fantastic walls with these raised boulevards. And as I mentioned, it's a it's a red brick city. So a lot of the the studies that we're doing and have done are to do with first of all how we take our place as a contemporary building um, beside the medieval wall, making extending this wall, coming as close as we physically can to it without touching it and extending this kind of language with the language of solid surfaces, cloistered walls, colonnaded walls, and windows. And looking at different colors of, of brick, uh, we're beside a Romanesque uh, church, as well as the uh, medieval wall. So we're in a city which is um, embedded with uh, a sense of, um, of history. And the, the, the working of, the, of this centered, central social space and I suppose maybe this image describes the way that we work. We work crudely with models, with hand models, with cardboard, as well as the parallel um, computer-generated images. And we visited, um, Yvonne was speaking about um, Chapel and the quarry in Milan. We visited a brick factory less than one hour from Toulouse, and it was like visiting a fantastic bakery where um, you, you get all kinds of bricks. You can get donuts, you can get squares, you can get big... Um, slabs of terracotta and they tell us that the the way they make the brick is exactly the same as the Romans did we're not sure if that's the case they say they're even the same size bricks um, and we when we proposed the using of brick in in Toulouse everybody said well what do you mean brick and we said well brick like <laughs> brick is a brick but um, the, in Toulouse they use um, contemporary architects use uh, prefabricated terracotta panels with aluminium uh, steel framing. And it, it feels really thin, and we just can't understand how in a place where this tradition is alive and where these materials exist, that they're not used. And so um, we're in the process of making a contemporary building with a very ancient uh, material. And it, it's amazing the difference between a factory made extruded brick and a brick made from a mold how even within the the kind of the the scale of the thing itself it has a whole other life which i suppose is another uh, discussion we'd just like to finish with um uh, a project which we're which we're working on at the moment which is a piece of city about the same size as um Bocconi. and just to use it to make um some general points of conclusion. Uh, Laurent Boudouin, French architect, in talking about the work of Sphere Fenn, um, uses a fantastic phrase. He, he talks about architecture being a machine for slowing time down, and that um, uh, natural time and human time are not in harmony, and that natural time is slow and human time is accelerated, and that the role of architecture is to slow time down. And this Chilida image, I suppose, is something that we often go back to because we visited Chilida's um, workshop and park outside San Sebastian and find that what's fantastic about the work of Chilida is that it, yes, it lets light in, but it also seems to, um, to be a vessel of light, to contain light, that light comes from within as well as from without. And Yvonne talked about um, architecture or architecture being a kind of new geography. And this is something we're experimenting with in this project, making a piece of city where we're trying to see how ground can, can reach up and how one can let uh, sunlight deep into the, uh, the density of an urban block. And mapping that uh, kind of um, carving and cutting of space to do with the... Uh, making a cut which allows south light into uh, an east-west block, but also making a space which would entice people to gather. I suppose it's one of the things that, again, one is very conscious of, that the role of architecture is to make space which brings people together at whatever scale, um, and to make spaces which map and track the movement of the sun and the seasons, and to make spaces where people would feel um, that they could come together uh, to exchange ideas, um, to socialize. And the thing of trapping of landscape within uh, dense urban blocks, the importance of 
of, of the humanizing of the workspace. In this case, it's simply an office building and this thing of making very large uh, insertions in historic city. How does one do that in terms of grain? And I've just spoken about perhaps the combination of the scientific mapping or monitoring of these ideas in parallel with the making of surface or the making of space. In this case, we're trying to take south light, as I say, deep into an urban block. And to use this as a way of, uh, or an idea of, a way of how um, combined with the, the way that people move, that if one maps and tracks the sun and makes um, spaces that people feel good in, that this will encourage this kind of socializing um, component of architecture. And uh, I remember many, many years ago, uh, Kenneth Frampton doing a review in Dublin and speaking so eloquently and poetically about the role of the staircase in the history of architecture that we'd never forgotten that and think a lot about staircases and how one can make staircases like hill towns or make spaces as staircases as uh, public space which allow you to move from the ground to the sky. And again, I suppose thinking about the Chilida thing of trapping light within, making vessels full of light um, which within which people can work and meet and um, live their lives. And, and just to conclude uh, on the dot of eight as required, um, we'd like to say that gravity asks us to think about what we do as architects, how we anchor our buildings into the earth. Since 2008, more than half of the world's population now live in cities, so what we build is the new geography. We are redefining the outer crust of our planet. Architecture is the shield and protector of our humanity. It mirrors our values. It is what defines us. Thank you. No. <laughs> no, I'm sorry, I'm joking. I, I yeah. heard the architect from Studio Mumbai speak recently, and what I was struck by uh, was his sense of the other aspects of life, the kind of feminine of life, let's say. And what I thought was fantastic was he talked about the moon. Not many men talk about the moon <laughs> in business, let us say. Um, <laughs> What was interesting was that he described, uh, we had been out with students the day before in Switzerland and there was a discussion about water divine and one of our students, I knew somebody who water divine, was able to take a hazel a kind of uh, twig and, and find water and the student kind of was very skeptical. And then at the, that evening there was a, you know, a major lecture by the studio Mumbai and he talked about getting this water diviner in India to find the place for this particular house. And it was amazing, the students, they just kind of looked at one another through the group and you know, that you know, there is this such a thing as other things that w go in the world. But it was his sense of, uh, like in Indian culture, it seemed to me that there was time uh, for the moon to enter in. And I, I don't think it's a kind of a sun and moon thing, but it was very beautiful to hear a, a gentleman of high intelligence and an architect of high intelligence talk about things that were the softer side of, of life, I suppose, and was able to make these incredibly beautiful images and places. The house was built, there's a pool in the, in the house, and there are circular discs to allow the moonlight through. It's absolutely beautiful. But, I mean, Shelley and I have this discussion about the, the w w one of the things is that architecture is not gender-based. I mean, being an architect, whether you're male or female, is not, is not the issue, really. Getting commissions, maybe, because you may or may not be uh, you know, um, wearing the right suit or being at the right whatever, that there might be an issue about how you get projects that might be an issue in terms of gender. But for us, what's been amazing is that we've had the pleasure and honor to be given projects in cultures that, that it was an issue. In Italy, you would have imagined that it might have been an issue, but it wasn't an issue. They took the architecture and the architects all in one go. It wasn't an issue. So I don't 
I don't think it's a matter of gender. I think it's a matter of opportunity. I mean, in schools of architecture, what happens is that there's 50% female and 50% male, and somehow they vanish from the landscape of architectural nature, which is a loss to this profession. It's a loss at one level, but maybe they're allowed very much to have a thing. So it's a very big question. It's a very big question about timing. Timing and what happens when children are born and whether they have time. So maybe there should be in the profession where there's other kind of patterns that people, it also demands a lot of men as well. It's just <coughs> a very big issue about how one has time. The tower. Uh, we've never been asked. Um, we've thought about it. I don't know what we'd do. What would we do? Um, Lena, well not Lena, um, Carla Pina has done a fantastic tower in Aguila del Jara. A fantastic tower. Um, where she comes up from the earth and has these pieces which kind of fold and out to the horizon. I think the huge amount of it is, this is a terrible thing to say, but it's about power and image and the eye and the issue of the tower being a symbol of power and who's got the tallest tower and who's got the biggest tower. And um, <laughs> uh, it, it was amazing looking out the window of the hotel today, looking in the mist at New York and watching you know, this is a, I talk about the new geography, when you come to Manhattan, it's, it's a mountain, and it's amazing. And watching Manhattan as a garden growing. Manhattan is the town of plots, and sometimes these towers rise up because of economic growth or whatever, or whatever. And then you go down and see the, you know, the, the, the Flatiron building, and it's, it's still amazing as a, you know, piece, it's a tower, but it's also a city block. Um, but I, I think the Kame Pinos Tower in Guadalajara, I don't know if you know it, it, it really is, I think it's wonderful because it it's like a tree and it's 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 an object but it's not about making objects or something yeah, and because air flows there's three elements which rotate around uh, a kind of pivotal space and it reminds me of a, a project done by Le Corbusier in in Algiers where he makes he makes uh, three he makes shifting forms which feel like they're sliding on a vertical column and somehow the way that the form is made, it engages with space, both internally and externally, and it's not just about making an object. I think that's why we've looked at that Kame Pino star, is that it somehow is, has the symbolic presence, but not the image-making dilemma uh, that many towers have. But it's something that Shelley touched on, that project we were, uh, uh, in terms of the small-scale project, the issue of sustainability. What I find amazing is you see these buildings at last in Dubai, and you know the sun is beating down, and you know it's a little bit hot in Dubai, mm -hmm. and you've got these glass towers, and you wonder what the hell is keeping those buildings from pulling people into that. So there's a whole issue of just making a tower because it's the tallest tower in the world, or making it as an object. It is that issue that, that um, uh, the whole issue of the eye versus reality, you know, the eye as object and selling objects and people wanting objects. But in the end, I suppose the, um, they say that there was a, an Irish woman, Mrs. O'Leary's cow who burnt down Chicago and then Chicago invented the elevator. So then you got tall buildings. So maybe we should claim, you know, the fact <laughs> that, that, uh, that tall buildings now exist. Um, I don't know anything about Mrs. O'Leary's cow. Yeah, that's what happened, it burnt down Chicago. Um, <laughs> I think it's a very interesting question. Um. The Tower of Alaska in Milan is a fantastic tower because it has a medieval quality. It feels like a piece of sienna or something, and it's it's incredibly mm, skeletal. And uh, I mean, it takes it, it, it's it's a risk. It, it 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 takes so many risks. That project in terms of language and um, um, how far it pushes. The, the skeletal quality. Um, May I okay. call you ask a question? Um, I, I thought that the idea of the tree was a very important question. And I think a lot of people have the ground in terms of architecture, but maybe not the ground of the tower. So I was wondering how you feel about the idea of the tower and the contemporary tower architecture and what that might mean for the future. There's a very interesting tower by a 
very interesting standard practice group called um, uh, Antonio Garcia Abreu, Antonio Garcia Abreu, who has made, uh, it's a fantastic project. Well, one of them is a, a tower in Palencia, I think it is, in Spain, where what he's done is he's taken precast pieces and made a tower which is essentially solid on the outside and carved great spaces as you walk through it. And what's interesting about that is he takes space into it. So instead of carving into the ground, he carves, it, it becomes a solid thing where it brings space into it as it clambers towards the sky. It's a very interesting project. It's for, um, I think it's for the School of Music. It's a university school of music. And um, I think there's a fascination about that work. Uh, that it's not about he's bringing, if you like, carved space and landscape into the into his domain. So that's a very interesting project. I don't know what the state is right now, but he's very interesting in terms of his work, in terms of going to first principles about, oh, he's done that amazing you know, that kind of uh, truffle in San Diego de Cal uh, in Galicia. It's a little um, uh, weekend house which was made for concrete and it's uh, he poured the concrete into the ground and then he poured more concrete and then he put stacks of hay inside and then he completed it as a spire, carved a hole in it and then theoretically a cow as the straw for a year and made a void in the interior. And this is a win uh, summer house, which is, uh, so he, the way he thinks is very interesting. He's two degrees in structural and master's degrees in structural engineering and he's an architect. So he goes to first principles and makes a uh, very interesting project. And the tower comes out from that kind of initial structural thinking and carving. It's, very, it's a very interesting project. Um, yeah, this might be sort of an extension of the last question. Uh, I noticed that you deal a lot with um, stone um, and uh, sort of carving and redistributing the earth uh, and kind of stacking up in a sort of stereotomic way of constructing, but uh, often it's stone or concrete. Um, and yeah, maybe this is how it relates to the tower. The towers seem to rel um, rely mainly on steel. Um, so I'm, I'm wondering if you have a fondness for um, stone or concrete or, or these kind of things, and that maybe that leads to that kind of scale. Or um, yeah, I suppose we, we well the answer is we do, and probably the fondness is um, it's to do with the materials, but it's also to do with this thing of enjoying mass and weight and weightlessness and those kind of old-fashioned things of surface and solidity and um, walls and solid things. But that's not to say, I mean, one's work is related to the opportunities and the conditions and the restrictions or the culture that you're operating in. I mean, we're, we're not exclusively interested in any one way of building. Um, it's just seemed the best thing to do at the time, given the projects that we've been working in, working on. But I suppose that's the reason why we talk about this thing of dialogue in dialogue with gravity. Um, there's a quote I have here, actually, which I really like, which is um, Inaki Abalos. He says, the wall will never again be that massive and inert conglomerate with which the ancients defended themselves against the weather. But why? Why can't they be? What, what, you know, why is architecture editing mass out so often? What's wrong with, with surface and masonry and concrete and all those things? But it doesn't have to be And it's not even material rate related. It's very yeah. interesting. In your own tradition, I mean, in Buffalo, you've got some incredible, the, the Sullivan buildings, which are steel framed with uh, clad pieces of terracotta with the most exquisite pieces of, of uh, they're like china, the, 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 the pieces. And what I find about Sullivan's work is that that's steel and, and articcio as well, but there's a solidity. I don't think it has to be, it doesn't have to weigh a ton to have that sense of surface. I, I think that the steel tradition here in the United States is incredible, you know, that you can actually, it's, I think it's the question we pose is probably more about you as architects. You're students of architecture, and we're practicing architects. And what we find is that many buildings are made, this is a terrible thing to say, but they're probably made by 
window catalogue at this age on projects. And it's not really thought about. We use the term, that you shouldn't use the term elevation because that's a construction thing where you elevate a building. But what you do, the physical word you should use is walking past it. You walk past the building. I mean, okay, you might drive, but you walk past the building. So your sense of time against the building. So you can have a still, still building with an edifying characteristic. I don't think it's just, you know, you do stone buildings and they're heavy and you do steel buildings and they're light and, and you know, you, you, you wear a t-shirt and become a kind of a British architectural kind of, you know, what are they, they upenders, what's the, was in Gulliver's Travels? It's, it's not even that, because I mean, you could make wonderful steel and glass buildings. I suppose it's just that that's been our response to the particular conditions that we found ourselves in. I don't think we're close to any language. I, I, I think it's a very interesting conversation because I think the questions come from the particular cultural setting uh, where the steel frame is dominant and where a certain kind of uh, maximized uh, skeleton of construction go up very high, et cetera, et cetera. You know, but, but from an engineering point of view, they're very conventional. And, uh, and uh, the, uh, the Carmet Pinos building, in, in which I've never seen in Guadalajara, must uh, involve, I think, you know, quite daring engineering operation. And, you, and your, uh, the Bocconi, for example, does also, I think, and has a daring engineering conception and then you know, structural engineers are able to to respond to that and to make uh, uh, architecture out of rather uh, intelligent uh, engineering inventions. Right? And one of the strange things I think in the United States is that because of the triumph of the steel frame in a way, certain kinds of engineering have uh, languished in the United States. So that, for example, uh, ingenious uh, Daring concrete engineering does not really occur in the United States. I mean, if you want to see, you know, really daring concrete engineers, you have to go to Brazil. You know, who, where, you know for example, the, uh, the Lina Bobadu thing, you know, I mean, it's unthinkable to do that uh, in, the in the United States, I think, because you just don't have that culture of engineering. I think one of the strange things is we always split between architecture and technology. And we never think of such a thing as a culture of technology, you know, that really, you know, in that division, we overlook that imaginative element and also the tradition that goes along with it. I mean, people have to, you have to have a climate in which it's possible to think like that. You can't just think like that, you know. But I think, you know, that explains why when you, you take the Frank Gehry's built bowels building, the steel is a mess inside that building, you know. and and. Uh, the Kulhas uh, CCTV is also, from an engineering point of view, very disappointing. I mean, it, it's a spectacular image, but actually it doesn't really have an engineering imagination, despite the great span and all the rest of it, you know. So I think that that's what's kind of fragile in some, I mean, I, I'm, I'm amazed that, you know, what the building in Toulouse presupposes uh, imaginative engineering, otherwise you can't do it, right? And and you did that in Bocconi also. So I think it's a very different, uh, I think you actually do, the way you think is, um, you know, quite unusual with regard to engineering, in my opinion. Where we are 
Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.